Welcome back to the Patras Review. Now in this episode, well, welcome back. I'm your host, Mila Sipka, and this is the Patras Review. Now in this episode, I'm going to review five films in one go. They're all five are available in Australia through the popular domain prints from the Flashback Entertainment, released about a decade ago or so, like 15 years ago. All these films can be found in public domain sources, and some of them are actually, some of them are actually suitable for fam, family viewing as well. Anyway, this episode, first film I'm direct, uh, reviewing is Mommy, which is a 1994 cheap jack thriller directed by Max Allen Collins and has a pretty killer plot hook. Now, after her mother is found, uh, after her teacher, sorry, is found dead in her classroom after having an argument with her tightly wound and highly ambitious mother, Jessica Ann Sterling, a young girl in primary school, begins to believe that her mother could be a serial killer. Uh, director Max Allen Collins is a writer who specializes in true crime, true life crime novels, TV shows, and even trading cards. In the early 1990s, he decided to become a filmmaker, taking the decision to adapt one of his short stories into a feature film. For the title role, he picked none other than Patty McCormack, the actress who, as a young girl, played 11-year-old serial killer badass Rodan Penmark in the 1956 classic The Bad Sea. 34 years later, and McCormack is back doing what she does best, playing somebody who's nice on the outside, but a mean, ruthless mother on the inside, literally. <laughs> Despite the amateurish nature of the production, if this was left in the hands of a much more professional seasoned director, who would be the Maya classic, McCormack pretty much rules the show as a ruthlessly determined mummy Sterling, conquering all before her with a sociopathic performance, as well as Brinka Stevens, one of the classic 1980s screen queens, and a capable actress herself, plays a counterpoint as McCormack's plain Jane sister. While I had some doubts about the decision by Collins to give younger Rachel Lemieux dialogue that is too advanced for somebody her age to handle, makes her sound like a teenager or a young adult, without losing credibility, the story is a fairly serviceable one, and Collins succeeds in making an interestingly average thriller that is somehow also suitable for family viewing. Who would imagine something like that? I would give this a C, which is a 4 out of 10, or 2 out of 5 stars. Basically an average film that isn't a bad film per se, but not exactly a good one either. Now, as for the parental advice for this film, there are some killings that are basic. The teacher falls off a ladder, Jennifer gets electrocuted at shooting without any gore being displayed. No sex and nudity. Now, film number two is a sequel to this film, Mummy's Day, also directed by Max Allen Collins, which came out in 1996, two years after the original. Now, here, granted the clemency right after she attempts an escape from the execution chamber, Mummy Sterling is given an implant which will curb her, her violent behavior and told to stay away from her daughter, which is an order that she ignores anyway. But somebody is going to the trouble of framing Sterling for a new series of murders as she tries to prove her innocence but the implant is making things difficult, so while her sister's husband seems to want it to fail, so he can make another best-selling novel of her plight. As the bodies of those who despise her begin to pile up, Sterling must fight to clear her name to win back custody of her daughter. While the original Mommy was a cheap jack and amateurish director video thriller that was never, nevertheless suitable for family viewing, this sequel ends up beating it and also making Penny McCormack into something of an anti-hero character. This time out, Max Allen Collins has decided to has managed to learn some much needed tips on how to stage his films better, or for there is nothing in this film that will prevent viewers from seeing the film as a cheap sequel that it is. Still, with its predecessor and villain turned to a something of a hero here, and the mystery angle being an excuse to showcase more creative murders, the film proves to be passable enough. Peggy McCormack, Rinka Stevens, and young actress Rachel Lemieux still make a good team of sorts, and the payoff is a lot more interesting than what you would originally consider a film like this to reveal. This view is part of the double bill with the original film and safe enough for kids to handle. I'll give this one a C plus, which is a 5 out of 10 or a 2.5 out of 5 stars, which means that this film is passable. There are some creative killings, but no gore scene. Now, as for sex and nudity, there's no sex, but Sarah Jane Miller uh, goes into a shower naked, but nothing sensitive is shown, and when she's electrocuted, the bottom part of her breasts are briefly visible. Collins took a slightly higher gamble on this one, but still plays it safe. Now, for review, review number 3, Christina's House. Directed by Gavin Wilding, or Wilding and released in 1999, which is about 20 years ago at the time of this review. Construction foreman James Towling moves his teenage daughter, Christina, and younger son Bobby to a rundown house close to the sanatorium where the disturbed mother is located. J James has hired a handyman, 
named Howie, to fix up the house while he's away on his work site, leaving the kids in charge of the house. As they settle in, Christina begins to experience strange occurrences where her diary goes missing only to return to its original position when she checks for it. Strange noises coming from the attic and her friends begin to go missing. What, the, what she doesn't know is that somebody close to her has been stalking her every move and by the time she finally learns who it is, the trap has already been set. This was an example of the many, many low-budget horror films and thrillers that wound up haunting the director video market of the late 1990s and early 2000s. It pretty much made a modest impression on some of those who saw it. It served as a debut for young actress Alison Lang, who would later go on to a modest director video career starring cheap sequels other classic thrillers. As far as things go, Christina's House is an average thriller hokum feature, nothing more, nothing less. It showcases some decent acting from all involved, although Brad Raug does go from slightly creepy handyman to full-blown psychotic in the finale, where it is revealed that his employee's deranged wife sent him to stall the employee's family and tap his way with the young do adult daughter, Lang, with her blessing. To this end, he has single-handedly modified the house into having a hidden structure with which he can slip through and even plaster through tough, tough plastic sheets over the windows, which the revelation of this particular modification is pretty effective in jolt. It is, and also a hidden master lock on the front door and death trap in the basement right under the front, front door's threshold. While the first two thirds make a mystery out of who the stalker could be, by the time the final third arrives, the payoff goes into the range territory considerably. Millennials might like stuff like this, and the film does do its job with the work mission that is admirably slick. But it doesn't quite have that spark that I would recommend as anything other than a routine directed video film product to the era. I give this one a C, 4 out of 10 or 2 out of 5 stars, an average flick. As to violence and gore, some killings by the psycho where people are strangled or have their necks snap, a man falling into a razor tra trap of surviving, whereas the psycho also falls into the trap that is crushed when a wooden dresser is uh, dropped on them, a sheriff now even missing being hit by a falling hammer. Not really any gore scene. There's no sex. Or for Alison Lang's boyfriend seems to have an obsession getting into her pants. He fails. On that point, what is it with having Lang practically shown naked when she goes into the bath? Offer Lang was clearly not a minor when the film was shot, but the character was a high school student. This kind of almost crosses a line where you almost see a breast. Actually, you can see a nipples in the bathtub. I'm glad director Gavin Wilding didn't truly cross the line, otherwise he would have had a serious problem on that front. As for the fourth review, we see into the film Fangs which was directed by former VFX technician Kelly Senefer, which came out in 2001. When a horde of genetically engineered mutant bats are accidentally freed from their holding pens inside the university science campus, a former big C homicide detective who is slumming it in a small town teams up with the local veterinarian to stop the bats as the creatures are killing anyone connected to the local real estate developer. Thanks to the directorial debut for visual effects technician Kelly Senefer, has gone on to make a series of family-oriented horror light director video features that feature light horror elements which don't won't trouble young viewers who are looking to break into the horror genre. The film is structured like a kid's cartoon with the characters all being stock types. The former big city cop slumming in a small town who is looking for a redemption by cracking tough case, the lovely one animal vet to a precocious teenage daughter and an annoying slacker boyfriend, the corrupt real estate developer who finds his past coming back to bite him, and the police chief on the chief on the developer's payroll. There is even a buffoonish fat security guy who winds up a victim of the killer bats. As far as this genre is concerned, Fangs plays a too safe and predictable for serious horror fans to enjoy, but the same elements make it a virtue for parents who want their kids to lighten up and enjoy the horror genre they love without exposing them to anything like profanity, sexuality, or gore. The story arc can be guessed very easily, and there's nothing here that would surprise anyone that knows even basic storytelling. Also notable is that there is a good morality tale that he had teach children that dishonesty will get into serious trouble. And the actors do a good job of playing their roles without being overboard, going overboard. Lightweight junk food viewing that is suitable for young kids, but adult horror fans will be laughing themselves in the sickness from the simple mind nature of the story. Now, violence and gore, the bad attacks are vicious like in a cartoony fashion, and the victim is badly gored, but the bodies are never shown on screen. There's no sex nudity here. This kid friendly to a T. I give this film a C plus, which is a five out of ten or two and a half out of five stars. Passable stuff. Now the fifth and last film to be reviewed in this episode is Inhabited, which is the second film from Kelly Center right after Fangs. Soon after moving to their new house, the Frostle family begin to experience what weird phenomena. Their daughter begins acting weird, talking to invisible friends in the old cubby house in the backyard. 
Items begin to disappear. Strange accidents occur, leading to mild injuries, and the family cat is brutally killed by a mysterious force. After the handyman, who arrives unexpectedly to fix the house, tries to explain that mysterious creatures live on the property, the mother, Meg Russell, begins to believe that the creatures, which are dangerous little elves known as a Holdra, have been responsible for the deaths of the previous tenants on the property decades before, and are planning to kill her family because they don't like their presence on the property. At the same time, a psychiatrist plans to use Russell's daughter as a guinea pig to prove his fear that the house harbors a psychosis that afflicts children. Two years after making his debut in the directorial film Fangs, Kelly Sandifer returns to Inhabited, which is a similar experience on the horror light field, with an emphasis on family-friendly entertainment. While the film was pretty much a joke as far as serious horror films go, it does, however, prove an interesting feature of a supernatural menace that will go a pretty decent way to spooking little children without offending their parents, even if by the time you finally see the little creatures appear, you begin to think that you can take on the little monsters and safely banish them with the underworld with the aid of a shovel or a baseball bat. There's no gore here, nor any bits or harsh language. The film has a decent pace which that make, makes the whole interest and provides some mystery to the exercise, but for horror fans who have already figured out the, the plot mechanics long before the characters get around to it, and some of the plot twists would be pretty neat for this kind of film. Parents who love horror films will find this to be a passable time waster, a good film to use to introduce their children to the horror genre at a level suitable for the little tugs without getting too intense or nasty. There is some mild violence scene here, but nothing that a young child cannot handle. There's no nudity, no sex. This is family friendly to a T. This film also gets a C plus. Now, all five films in this episode were released by Flashback Entertainment, which was one of the biggest bargain basement DVD labels in Australia. From the early 2000s to the early 2010s, Flashback put out a lot of $2 to $5 DVDs, and also became known for the large range of 10 film box sets, which are pretty e easy to find if you go to enough flea markets to cheap use DVD retailers. I've owned quite a few of those myself. The quality of these, all of these titles is pretty much on the average to passable side, but at least you get a chance to see them for not much in terms of cost. Plus, if you don't like the discs, you can turn them into novelty coasters without much guilt. That's it for this episode.